This is Unit 3, and we'll start with the Chapter 3 lecture. Unit 3 covers digestion, energy balance, and physical activity. We begin with digestion. This chapter covers digestion, absorption, and we'll dip a little bit into metabolism as well. Certainly, biochemically, you are what you eat because the foods and the beverages that you consume are broken down into smaller parts that can be used by the body. And that essentially is what digestion is about. Now, if you click into this link here, what you'll find is a really neat video that I would recommend um, by National Geographic. It's a couple of minutes long and it uses a camera that travels through the GI tract. It's pretty neat. So here is the definition of digestion, the breaking down and absorption, the moving into the body proper. Be sure to know the order of the digestive organs. When we're together in a classroom, we typically kind of line ourselves up. Uh, we'll be talking through this, but you should uh, perhaps study those before the test. So we'll start with the mouth. And in the mouth, we see the two types of digestion, both the chemical or enzymatic breakdown, because we have salivary amylase, but also the mechanical digestion, the chewing, the crushing. Of course, after the chewing and the forming of the bolus, there is the swallow. And the swallow is an amazingly complex uh, movement that involves quite a few muscles and nerves and sets up a kind of precarious situation here because the passageway to the lungs sits right next to the passageway to the stomach. Now, when you swallow, what should happen is that a cartilage structure called the epiglottis covers up the passageway to the lungs. And that's very important. If an entire bolus moves into the trachea, this can cause choking, which can be deadly, of course, because the individual can't get uh, the air that they need to survive. The um, first aid procedure that is done is the Heimlich maneuver, now called abdominal thrust, and it's extremely effective and every healthcare professional learns how to give this. And there are different uh, ways to do it depending on the age of the individual, the size of the individual, etc. Now, choking is one thing. Dysphagia or dysphagia is another. Dysphagia is difficulty in swallowing. It can cause choking but more likely than not, the real fear around dysphagia is something called aspiration, where food or liquids move into the lungs and cause aspiration pneumonia because that foreign uh, substance should not be there and bacteria then act on it. So it can be deadly for a compromised patient or an elderly patient. We need to take note of the signs of dysphagia and you'll see them on this video or this slide so be sure to look at them. I've seen a number of these when I was a um, nursing home dietitian. Gurgly or raspy sounding voice, food falling out of the mouth. You see they're all signs that the swallow is not working as it should click into this link for sure and you'll see the video swallow exam. The professional who assesses and develops a care plan for the person with dysphagia is a speech language therapist and one of the tests they can run is the video swallow so take a look and a listen to that. Now for someone with dysphagia their dietary consistency may have to be changed. 
and that may involve purees, but not necessarily. I'm very, very careful about the idea of throwing everyone with dysphagia on purees because it's a very boring diet and weight can be lost because of a loss of interest in food. So only give a puree diet when necessary or perhaps as a stopgap until the speech therapist is able to do the evaluation. Many patients with dysphagia are able to have soft foods, chopped meats with gravy. There are all sorts of different um, modifications. Now, the other modification that occurs with the diet is the thickening of liquids. Thin liquids are harder for the mouth to handle. Thick liquids um, the individual has more control over. So the liquids can be thickened and often that is part of the prescription. But you must be careful because thickened liquids, because they are not as refreshing and perhaps tasty, individuals can develop dehydration if they are not encouraged to drink enough. Oh, I forgot to tell you about molded purees. This is what purees should look like in 2020. It's simply a matter of using molds and they're lovely to the eyes and that can make all the difference to the appetite. All right, so the swallow moves the bolus down the esophagus through a muscular movement called peristalsis. And at the bottom of the esophagus, at the juncture between the esophagus and the stomach, is the gastroesophageal or lower esophageal sphincter. This sphincter is very important because it prevents the backflow of the very acidic contents of the stomach into the esophagus. The stomach is protected by its coat of mucus. The esophagus is not, and this acid not only cause, causes pain, but also can damage the walls of the esophagus, causing scarring and also causing um, a precancerous condition in some. So it can be very dangerous if you have heartburn often. This article takes you to a number of suggestions for lifestyle changes. Certainly medications are an option, but for some with more milder heartburn, um, you can actually make some change in symptoms through these lifestyle modifications, such as not filling your stomach too much with food because that increases pressure, not lying down right after eating because then you lose gravity um, holding the food back from backwashing, um, sleeping at a little bit of a tilt, putting bricks or risers at the head of your bed, and onward. Okay, Losing weight is another that helps a lot of people with heartburn. And of course, avoiding things that irritate the mucosa or that loosen the sphincter. Mints, by the way, peppermints can loosen the sphincter and make heartburn worse. So definitely read in your textbook and that article. And acids are an option and one of the most widely used over-the-counter over and prescription medication. But keep in mind that the newer antacids, the proton pump inhibitors, um, actually are so effective at reducing acid that they can also cause other problems. So we're seeing low bone density, we're seeing um, B12 deficiency. The recommendations these days is to use the least effective antacid as possible for those reasons. I want to stress that acid is meant to be in your stomach. It not only kills bacteria, um, begins the digestive process of proteins, but it also helps enable the digestion of a number of vitamins and minerals. So when you reduce it too much, there can be a price to pay. The small intestine is absolutely, oh, I'm sorry, I jumped ahead. We're still at the stomach. The stomach's very muscular, so you'll notice here that it's a muscular organ. It takes solids and liquids and churns them to a liquid called chyme, which moves on to the small intestine. So read through the information on the stomach for sure. 
Before we move on to the small intestine, we should mention the problem of ulcers. Um, ulcers are erosions in the wall of the stomach, and this, they can occur in the small intestine as well. We now that know that most ulcers are caused by an acid-resistant bacteria called H. pylori. And for that reason, antibiotics have been become an important part of the treatment, actually not only important, the most important part of the treatment for ulcers, for most ulcers. The diet is rather simple. In the past, it was suggested that you drink lots of milky, creamy things every couple of hours, and we now know that was a diet that only made things worse. Every time you put something in your stomach, your stomach secretes acid. So it's much better just to eat your standard three meals, avoid the foods that cause pain, avoid things that um, like uh, contain caffeine or other substances in coffee and tea, and avoid alcohol. One more valve here to talk about right now, and that's between the stomach and the small intestine, the pyloric valve. The pyloric valve is important as a regulator, making sure that your entire contents of stomach doesn't move into your small intestine at once. When that happens, because of a pro problem with this valve, maybe due to surgery, uh, that's called the dumping syndrome, and it can cause hypoglycemia, and it can also, um, cause problems like cramping, diarrhea, etc. So it's very, very uncomfortable. Not horribly uncommon. You probably will come across a patient with dumping syndrome, and there are things that are recommended. Smaller meals, more protein, less carbohydrate in the meals. So let's talk about why those recommendations are made. When we look at pure carbohydrate or meals high in carbohydrate, protein, and fat, they leave the stomach at different rates. So the first thing to leave is carbohydrate, next protein, next fats. So for someone who is having problems with food moving too quickly from the stomach, you certainly wouldn't want them to be consuming a high carbohydrate diet. You would want them to consume more protein in their diet. The other consideration here has to do with people who are trying to lose weight. In the past, of course, we recommended that everyone follow a low-fat diet for weight loss. The problem with a low-fat diet was that it tended to be high in carbohydrate. Food left the stomach quickly, and people were hungry all the time. Now, when you see any advice good advice around weight loss. The advice is to consume some fat or protein with your meals and snacks so that you will stay satisfied for a longer period. It's very hard to lose weight when you're hungry all of the time. The small intestine is where m almost all of the digestion and absorption takes place, somewhere around 90%. And you can read through the slide and see why that is so. We're set up with enzymes and secretions from the pancreas and the liver um, and in the intestinal wall. And for most of us, this whole process goes off without a hitch. We also have tremendous absorptive capacity in this 10 feet or so of tubing that's about an inch across. If you pulled it flat, you'd have, have about the surface area of a tennis court because of all these ripples and folds. So enzyme-rich environment with loads of absorptive capacity. And then right beneath the, the cells that line the small intestine are the circulatory systems, the blood circulatory system and the lymphatic system. So once things are broken down, absorbed, they're ready to move out. Do read about celiac disease. Pretty interesting stuff. Um, this is one of the more common uh, hereditary diseases and we're seeing a bit more of it. And they're starting to link it to some of the substances in our environment, such as pesticides and things found in plastic.
So just some of that is newer information coming out. What's interesting about celiac disease is it's a, a autoimmune reaction to gluten. And when you have gluten in the diet, you see a flattening of the small intestine and tremendous malabsorption. If you take gluten out of the diet, you see the reverse. Some people are walking around with celiac disease and just put up with the symptoms. So if you have digestive symptoms that have gone on and on, it's a good idea to get that checked out by a specialist. But you don't want to go on a gluten-free diet if you're not sure because you need to have the testing when your intestine looks like this. There are a lot of people who follow a gluten-free diet because they think it's healthier. And this actually is not necessarily true. There are gluten-free healthy foods and then there's gluten-free junk. So a gluten-free diet doesn't mean it's a healthier diet. It's actually, it's absolutely required for someone with celiac disease, but not necessarily um, for others. There's also a condition called non-celiac gluten um, sensitivity or gluten intolerance, and that's a real thing. Some people don't have celiac disease, but they can't tolerate gluten. The large intestine comes next. Um, this is some fascinating stuff, and I know I have a video linked up. I want you to listen to it. More and more, we're learning about the importance of the intestinal microbiota, the microbes that live in and on us, in this case, in our intestine, and how they are important to our overall health. Also, here is the video, please do listen. How this intestinal microbiota has changed along with our lifestyle to allow or maybe encourage some of the diseases that we're suffering from. So definitely listen to that. There may be a test question. What do we do about that? Two things, probiotics, prebiotics. Prebiotics are the fiber rich carbohydrates, poorly digested carbohydrates that feed those microbes. These are not the only food. If you follow a high fiber diet, you're generally feeding your healthy microbes in your GI tract. Probiotics are the actual microorganisms. Some of them are found in food, okay, fermented foods for the most part, and you can see that here. Some of them are found in supplements. The GI tract is connected to our immune system for sure. And a couple of conditions I'll go quickly over, but do look in your textbook. Diarrhea is when things move through the large intestine too quickly and not enough fluid is reabsorbed. The BRAT diet is for short-term use only, okay? But these types of foods are kind of mild and have a little bit of the soluble fiber that might help um, resolve the diarrhea. People with diarrhea illnesses can eat, it's okay, but they should avoid caffeine and lactose for sure. The major concern around diarrheal illnesses is dehydration, so replacing fluids is important. Constipation is when things slow down, and there's so many reasons for that. One, of course, is aging. Another is pregnancy, but the matter doesn't move as quickly as it should through your colon and too much water is reabsorbed, making the bowel movement passage difficult. There is more and more constipation, um, and that's anecdotal. I'm hearing about it in all ages, which is due probably to our lifestyle. Not enough exercise, not enough fluid, not enough fiber. So we need to attend to those things. There are certainly some medical interventions that are out there and of consideration, laxatives being one of them. But when you get to this point, I think you should see a gastroenterologist. So try the fiber, try the fluid, try the exercise. Don't increase fiber without increasing fluid. Diverticular disease comes from a weak bowel that has not been exercised or strengthened uh, because of a low fiber diet over the years. And you have these out pouches that can become inflamed and infected. Generally speaking, a high fiber diet is a great idea 
to lessen your risk for diverticulosis. Colon cancer is still one of the most deadly of the cancers, and what is concerning about colon cancer is that although it is still much more common in older individuals, we are seeing more cases in younger and middle-aged adults than in the past. And this, this may be a result, again, of changes in our diet and our lifestyle. It seems that a high fiber diet, because it decreases transit time, which means things move through more quickly, a high fiber diet also lessens the contact time uh, for any carcinogens to the bowel wall. High fiber diet lowers your risk. And finally, some alternate feeding methods. If an individual cannot take food by mouth, there are options. If the gut works, use it, is the dietitian's um, saying here around tube feedings. You use a tube feeding if, as long as you have a functioning GI tract. If not, you can consider total parental nutrition. So if the GI tract doesn't work, you can give enough nutrition through um, the venous root um, but there has to be, in this case, a catheter actually by the heart to administer the nutrients. So it's a high risk of infection and very expensive, but it is a possibility. You take a look at this, how the digestive tract changes and how this all fits together with the cardiovascular system and the liver, be sure to review that. And real, real quickly, I just want to mention the metabolism of nutrients and encourage you to listen to this YouTube video. As we talk about metabolism, we're going to use it as the bridge to energy balance. So this is all pretty much of a review for you. Certainly, we have this seesaw or this balance of anabolic pathways and catabolic pathways uh, occurring in our cells at all times. As we break things down, that produces energy and we use that energy to build others. And what we end up with here is very, very important in terms of fasting versus feasting. So let's take a look at this and then we'll close up this chapter. But this is rather important and we probably will preview it at the beginning of next chapter. Energy balance is a um, balance between the energy you consume and the energy you expend. The energy you consume, we just talked about, that's through the digestion of carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. The energy you expend is a number of things. Most, your met metabolic rate, your metabolism, and for most, secondly, your physical activities. When you're consuming more than you're expending, you gain weight. When you are expending more than you're consuming, you lose weight. So I'm going to leave it here because I want to spend a little more time on this at the beginning of the next chapter as a lead in.